And so last time uh, we were in the book of Revelation and we were looking at uh, chapter 12 <clears throat> and we saw this image of the dragon uh, who is a symbol of Satan. And we began to look at the fact that Satan is the, the cause of much of the, uh, the, the um, anti-Semitism and anti-God sentiment that we see uh, throughout history and growing in our world today, even in our own nation. And as we began to look at this picture that was given to us in chapter 12 of the dragon of Satan, and, and we began to look at, well, what is he like and how it, does his existence help us understand uh, the things that are going on in the world? And more importantly, how does knowing about him help us live a life that is going to please God and that is going to accomplish God's purposes uh, in us and through us and to not get distracted or dis derailed by the different things that we see going on around us. And so this morning, we are going to continue uh, along the same vein, along the same vein. Last week, the title of the sermon was Know Your Enemy. Uh, this week's title is Know Your Enemy, Part Two. I like that, very clever, very original. Uh, and the subtitle could be, Beware Politicians and Preachers. Beware Politicians and Preachers, because that's really what our text is about this morning. The same theme carries over from chapter 12 into chapter 13. And whereas in chapter 12, we saw Satan, who is, uh, who is at the, the bottom of the kinds of things we were talking about, uh, this week, we see uh, two other characters introduced to us through John's vision, his revelation. These are earthly figures through whom Satan's will is accomplished on earth, particularly during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so again, before we get into the text, I just want to remind everybody that, uh, that uh, in this section of the book of Revelation, uh, the church is not mentioned. The believing community as it is constituted today by us, Jews and Gentiles, uh, who live in our day, uh, will not be present at that time. There will be believers on the earth, as we'll read about in this text, but those, those will be people who will come to faith after we have been caught up in the air in what, the, what we call the rapture, where we join the Lord, Lord in the air and we get to be with him and to uh, avoid the outpouring of his wrath on the rest of humanity during uh, this seven-year tribulation period that leads up to Messiah's return to rule and to reign after he defeats his enemies. And so as we look at our text this morning, we're going to ask the same question that we asked last week, which is how do we keep from getting swept up into or silenced by the spiritual forces at work to corrupt our world. The spiritual forces that would be that are at work in our world. And those forces are constantly at work, not only to corrupt the people around us, but to shut us up, to make us ineffective, to cause us to doubt, to cause us to shut our mouths and to not speak up for righteousness and truth because of what's going on around us. And so as we looked at the, the answer to that question last week was know your enemy. Again, that's what we're going to be looking at this week. Uh, we want to be able to know our enemy. And chapter 13 gives us snapshots of two manifestations of our enemy and his mode of attack. Okay, so we're going to have two snapshots of, uh, of people who Satan is going to use, during, especially during those last three and a half years of the tribulation period, uh, as he seeks to, uh, Satan seeks to finally uh, overthrow God's rule and reign on earth, claiming it for himself. And so the text this morning's text, chapter 13, breaks down into two big chunks. 
uh, based on each of these characters. The first chunk is chapter 13, verse 1 through 10, and the second chunk is chapter 13, verse 11, uh, to the end of the chapter, uh, verse 18. And so the first thing that I want us to see is through this first big chunk of text, this first half of the chapter, is that if we want to know our enemy, the thing we need to know about our enemy is that he wields this dominating political power, this dominating political force. And that's the picture that we have drawn for us. Now, this political force is, of course, cast in terms of its spiritual underpinnings. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that what is pictured for us is manifest in terms of politics. And so we're going to see here uh, this picture uh, of, a, uh, of the person we call the Antichrist. Now, just by way of further introduction to chapters 12 and 13, uh, many, many scholars of the Bible point out the fact that between chapters 12 and 13, there are three figures, characters that are identified and that there is an eerie correlation between those three characters and the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that what we have pictured for us in chapters 12 and 13, if you will, is a counterfeit triune spiritual authority. And it's helpful to think about it that way because it helps us understand that that these forces are not separate, but that they are working in concert with each other to achieve the same ends. And so chapter 12, we met, of course, the dragon, who is the counterfeit father. And he is the one who rules and controls everything, and he is the one whose will is being done. Just generally speaking, that's true of the father. And then in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, we meet the beast from the sea. And as you'll see as we go through this, the beast from the sea is a counterfeit Messiah. And commonly we refer to him as the Antichrist, which is the name John gives to him uh, in his letters. He says that there are many Antichrists coming, and this one is the ultimate Antichrist, the one who sets himself up in place of Messiah to rule and reign over the nations. And so uh, we, this, this, this character that we're going to meet in verses 1 through 10 is the same person that Daniel refers to as the little horn, and it's the same person that the Apostle Paul refers to as the man of lawlessness. And so he, this is not the only place in the scriptures where this character is spoken of or identified. But he is a false messiah, even to the point where he receives a fatal wound and is resurrected from the dead. That he rules over, the, as we'll see, all of the nations of the earth, even as the messiah will upon his return. And then finally, the third part of this counterfeit triune spiritual authority comes in the last half of chapter 13, verses 11 to 18. The beast from the earth is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Uh, in chapter uh, 16, verse 13, he's referred to as the false prophet, and he serves the beast from the sea. He serves the Antichrist, and he leads others to worship him, and he marks the beast's followers, he seals them with a mark the same way the Holy Spirit seals the followers of Messiah uh, with himself, with the, with the sign of the Holy Spirit as, that were, as, it, uh, as, it, as it were. So there's this picture of, this, of, of a triune spiritual authority that is, sets itself up in opposition to God. And if you stop and you think about it, that's really the whole theme of the book of Revelation, isn't it? The whole theme of the book of Revelation is that starting from the garden with the, uh, with the, with, with the corruption of our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, 
we see this cosmic struggle going on between God and Satan acted out on the earth as to who will finally get dominion over God's creation. And so that's the picture that we have here for us. And so what I want us to see from this first chunk is that our enemy wields a dominating political force, that he works through politics. He works through politics. And so uh, he, the, the, our enemy, uh, this, the anti-Messiah or anti-Christ, as he's commonly called, same idea, Greek name, uh, Hebrew name, uh, is a person who represents an empire. Okay, he's a person who represents an entire empire. And it's important to understand that because when you begin to dig down into the symbolic language that John uses here and in other places, it gets confusing because some of the symbols he uses are for kingdoms and empires, but other symbols he uses are for kings and individual rulers. And so... Uh, there's a debate here among scholars, is the beast from the sea an empire or a person? And you think, well, it's an empire because if you look at verses one and two, it's a description of a kingdom and it relates to uh, the fourth kingdom mentioned by the prophet Daniel in Daniel seven and following. Uh, but then when you get into verses three and following in our text, you begin to see pictures of him as an individual, one who receives a, a fatal wound and who is revived from the dead, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wanted to just read this quote uh, from Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who addresses this issue of whether the beast is an individual or an empire. He says this, the word beast in the book of Revelation then is a reference to the empire of imperialism in its final and fifth stage, the Antichrist stage. And so this is uh, Fruchtenbaum's language for a revived Roman empire, if you will, because the last beast, the fourth, be fourth beast and Daniel crushes the others, et cetera, et cetera. And so here we have a revival of a similar kind of imperial kingdom that is able to destroy and take command over all other kingdoms around it in its time. So it says it's, it's final in stage as well. I'm sorry. It is proper to view the beast both as the fourth Gentile empire in its final stage, as well as personally of the Antichrist himself. In the book of Revelation, the word will be used in both senses. Sometimes it will be used to describe the fourth Gentile empire as a whole in its fifth and final form, while at other times it will be used to describe the Antichrist personally, who is the ruler over that empire, specifically in that time. And so it can represent the empire and it can represent uh, the, uh, the ruler of the empire itself. And so... John describes the beast for us, and he describes the beast in terms where it is evident that he is a king or an emperor leading a Gentile empire under Satan's authority. You got that? That's going to be, that's the, that's the takeaway from the picture we're going to look at in a minute, that he paints this picture of a king or an emperor leading a Gentile empire at Satan's uh, at Sat as Satan's region, as his man on earth. And so in verse one, look with me at verse one, it says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having 10 horns and seven heads. And on his horns were 10 diadems or wreaths and on his heads were blasphemous names. And so you've got heads, you've got crowns, you've got diadems and it's like, oi, right? Uh, it, it, it can be really, really overwhelming. But basically, what I want you to, to understand about this picture is that when he says a beast coming out of the sea, he could be talking about Gentile nations. In other words, that this is a Gentile kingdom, 
because the sea is often associated with uh, Gentile kingdoms and empires. Uh, it also can mean, uh, it could be a symbolic picture of the abyss, of the abyss that we read about earlier and we'll read about again in the book of Revelation. And the reason for that is because it is said later in the book in chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, that the, this beast comes out of the abyss, comes out of the abyss. And so what I would like to suggest is that we can take the, both of those ideas of a Gentile empire and it coming out of the abyss because it is de demonically, satanically inspired and empowered and put those things together. And so we have a picture of a king and a kingdom that is Gentile in nature and also is serving uh, Satan himself. And when it talks about the ten horns, the seven heads, and the ten diadems, uh, it, it is referring to several different things. And so I'm just going to give this to you quickly. I'm not going to try to dig down on this at all. But the heads represent kingdoms or empires in succession. That's kingdoms or empires, one after another. You got that? You don't, you, in terms of biblical history, the way uh, history is depicted for us, one kingdom, one empire follows another uh, or has ascendancy over the other. And then in the horns represent, of course, horns always represent authority, and they often represent kings. But kings, unlike empires, can rule simultaneously. So for instance, you can have one empire that has 10 kings, a 10 king confederation that comprise that one empire. And then of course, the diadems are, uh, are royal headbands and they're symbols of authority wielded by the king of a kingdom. And the idea of blasphemous, blasphemous names are titles claiming divine authority, uh, et cetera. And so a, a great example of that is, what's the name of the king uh, we're gonna be reading about next week as we begin to celebrate Hanukkah? Who was this, uh, the king of the Greeks at the time who invaded Israel? Antiochus Epiphanes, which means what? God manifest. God manifests. So in the same way, these political entities, these kings, will be identified as fake gods. They will claim authority that is not theirs to claim, but it will be ascribed to them. And then in verse 2, he goes on and he says this. He says, and the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And so if you're familiar with the book of Daniel at all, what you realize immediately as he describes this empire or this kingdom, he is describing it in the same terms he describes the beasts that Daniel sees in his vision, which, uh, which represent Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, and then... Um, Greece. I get that right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and so he, so, and, and what's interesting here is Daniel is looking ahead and, and lists the beasts as they will come in history. John is looking back in his vision. And so the beasts are listed uh, in reverse order. And so it is a picture, the whole, the basic thing that I want to, want to, what I want to bring out to you is, is that if you go to Daniel, you read these different descriptions of the nature of these three different kingdoms. And then, of course, the fourth kingdom that destroys the other three, which is Rome. And he's saying, so by bringing these together in this way, these images of uh, the bear, the lion, uh, the leopard, etc., he is saying that this kingdom that will exist during the tribulation period will have all of the features of these three kingdoms and more. That it will be vicious, it will be powerful, it will be swift, it will be all of the things that are used to describe the previous kingdoms. And so he, he, just, he says that it's going to be this superpower 
this superpower, and we'll see how he develops that further as we go on. And then again, in verse 2, he says, uh, and the dragon, who is who? Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan gave him power and his throne and great authority. And so here's the same picture, remember? Who, who rules on earth for God, the Father in heaven? Messiah Jesus. Who sits with him on his throne in heaven? Messiah Jesus. So in the same way, we have Satan's regent on earth exercising his dominion, his throne, his authority. And so he paints this picture of, uh, again, what's my point? It's a political entity. It's a kingdom. And so don't, don't think, you know, like a fantasy. Think reality. Think political powers. Think Ayatollah Khomeini. Think of your favorite uh, despot in history who took over an entire nation and absorbed other countries and other kingdoms around it and ruled with an iron fist. That's the same picture that we have here in this final kingdom. And then John goes on in verses, the second half of verse 3 and in verse 4, he describes the world's response to the beast. And the response is simply one of worship. And he says this, he says in verse 3, I saw one of its heads as if it had been slain and its fatal wound was healed. And so again, here is another indication that this is a fake Messiah and the, this ruler over this kingdom apparently will suffer some kind of fatal wound. And it, uh, later in the chapter, it's referred to as by the sword. And so we can assume that it's an assassination attempt or a, a, uh, in a military campaign or something like that. But this ruler is raised from the dead. He's raised from the dead. And people are impressed with this guy. And they are impressed with the fact that he has come back from the dead, that he has apparently, from their perspective, defeated death. And he gives us this description of people's response as being awestruck, worshipful reverence for his authority and his indomitable power. And look how he says that. He says, they worship the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? Now, when you hear the words, who is like, you should automatically go, bing, 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 Exodus, bing, 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 Exodus 15, bing, 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 Mika Mocha, Mika Mocha, Baalim Adonai, who is like you, O Lord? And so there is an intentional coupling of these ideas and that people will respond to this political leader in a way that the same way that Israel and Moses responded to God's indomitable power over their enemies in the Red Sea. It's the same idea. It's the same idea. And so he goes on, and, and so why do they follow and worship him? Why is it they follow and worship him? And he goes on and he unpacks that for us. Uh, verse 5 what I want to suggest is you could say in verse 5, they follow him and they worship him. And, and when we talk about worship, don't always think in terms of, you know, bowing down. There, there, there may have been that involved in it. But worship is ascribing worth to someone. Worship is looking to someone as the answer. Worship is trusting someone to meet all of your needs. That's what we're talking about, worship. And so why is it that people responded this way to this leader? And the first is that, that, that he, was, he was a winner. <laughs> he was a winner. Look at verse 5. He says, John says, There was given to him, that is the beast from the sea, the Antichrist, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months 
uh, was given to him, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Now, this idea of was given to him, I just want to, uh, to suggest that, that in one sense, his authority was given to him by Satan. But in the ultimate sense, his authority was given to him only by the providence of God. None of what he had, he would have had, had not God permitted it and had not God planned to use it in the fulfilling of his end time promises. And so he is a winner. He, he beats everybody. He blasphemes God. He lies about God. He's the perfect propagandist, if you will. Isn't that exactly how communist regimes win over people? It's by telling the big enough lie loud enough and often enough that everybody begins to believe it. And this is what the beast is like. And he says that he dominates everybody. He has got a, he not only does he control the press through propaganda by speaking lies about God and about his person and his character and his rule and his authority. And, and, and just, you know, here's, here's a quick illustration. You will surely not die. You know, everything I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you about life and what's important and how to live life and what's right and what's wrong is true because I'm telling you that. But it's not. It's a lie. It's a blasphemy. And that's exactly what he does. Then he goes on and he says, not only does he control the narrative or control the press in this way, but he's got complete and total military dominance. He's got worldwide geopolitical dominance. And look again at verse 7, which I just read. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. <laughs> All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone, I'm sorry, no, I went too far. All right. Look at verse 7, the last half. How does he describe the degree of of his rule and reign and his, his domination. Two categories. He was given him to make war with the saints, and I believe that's a reference both to Israel nationally and geopolitically, because Israel has now been driven out of Jerusalem and is being kept safe in hiding by God. So from the world's perspective, he's defeated Israel by removing them out of the way, as well as the saints those who are believers in Messiah Jesus, those who he is executing and defeating, who have the nerve to stand up against him. But then he says uh, to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Well, that should take you right back to what? The scope of Messiah's rule and reign and authority, that he is going to raise up citizens for his kingdom from all of the same places, from all over the world. And you see that? So there's a picture here by speaking of making war with the saints, which he doesn't notice. It doesn't say he, he, he defeats them finally, but he does overcome them because he's driven them into exile. And the rest of the world. So he's got complete geopolitical dominance over the entire world. And so the entire world comes and worships him as a result. All who dwell on earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. And so he says, everybody except believers in Messiah Jesus are going to worship him. And what's going to happen to the believers in Messiah Jesus who refuse to worship him, who refuse the mark of the beast? They are executed. They are executed. But he says the whole world is going uh, to worship him. And so, so here, here's my point. I'm going to come back to these, uh, the concluding verses uh, in a minute. Uh, but So how do we keep from getting swept up into or silenced by the spiritual forces that we see at work around us? And so we see this picture of the future. This is the future. We're not going to be here for it. 
but we recognize that the same modes are being used by our enemy today to dissuade us, to overcome us, to make us silent, and to make us ineffective. And we have to be wary of these forces. Now listen, listen carefully. I want you to, to not misunderstand what I am saying because the scriptures teach clearly that government is from God. That government is from God. And it is from God to establish and to fulfill a specific purpose. That is to punish evil and to reward good. But as soon as government flip-flops its responsibility and starts rewarding evil and punishing good, it's no longer of God. And it's no longer to be obeyed. Because when the government says, you can't go out and preach the good news, you can't share Jesus with anybody anymore, as the governments of Russia have done, as the governments of China has done, and in many other uh, communist nations, Cuba just off our, our coast here, when that happens, believers say, no, we must obey God and not man. But we have to recognize that Satan is at work through the political structures around us to discourage us, to dissuade us, and to shut us up. And we have to recognize that and respond to it for what it is, regardless of the cost, regardless of the cost. And so, uh, you know, so let, I'm going to go on because I really want to try to finish the chapter, okay? And uh, we can talk about this more later <laughs> if you want. Uh, but so, so how do we keep from getting swept up or silenced by the spiritual forces around us? And it's knowing our enemy. It's recognizing that Satan is behind all of this, but that Satan, one of his principal uh, vehicles is going to be the Antichrist through a worldwide government, but that even today, Satan is using governments of the world to try to silence his people, his saints, who have been commissioned to share his good news. And so we want to be wary of that. But he goes on, and, and not only does, uh, does our enemy uh, use political systems that usurp God's and Messiah's place in our lives, he uses deceptive spiritual influences to redirect people's dependence from God onto not God, basically. So he uses religious structures. He uses religious structures. So just as there is a counterfeit political system that he establishes, so too there is a counterfeit spiritual system, religious system that he uses as well. So look with me now at chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And so the picture that, the, the, that uh, John is given here uh, is of another beast. And so when it says another beast, it's not saying a, a, another beast like a completely different beast. The word actually means another of the same kind. And so they're related to each other. And he says that it's coming up out of the earth. And this may be uh, an allusion to his, uh, his um, uh, human uh, nature uh, versus heavenly nature. Uh, and he goes on and he says, he talks about he has two horns like a lamb. And so the horns represent what? They represent authority. But then he says, like a lamb. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you this question. How many times is the word lamb used in the book of Revelation that does not apply to Messiah Jesus, the Lamb of God? You're looking at it. This is it. One. Every other reference to lamb in the book of Revelation applies to God's lamb, our sacrifice and resurrected Messiah. And so there is a clear connection being made uh, between this man's character as a lamb, that there is a gentle character to him uh, that is different from the fierceness of 
the beast prior. And it says, and he spoke as a dragon. So even though he was gentle and had this religious air about him, he spoke as a dragon, meaning what? He lied, just his nature. Whatever it came out of his mouth, you know a man is lying. How do you know a man is lying? When his lips are moving, right? And it's a terrible joke. Uh, but you know this beast is lying when his lips are moving. And then John continues and he says, okay, so there are different five things that he has said to make, do, exercise, or cause. And all of those are come from the same Greek word, uh, uh, po- uh, yeah, poieo. And so here he says he exercises or makes or causes all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And so, first of all, he is able to exercise the first beast's authority. He is, his, he is not <clears throat> acting on his own, but he's acting in behalf of the first beast. And he says he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And so his role is not only to speak the lies using the authority of the Antichrist, but he is also, his responsibility is to bring the unbelievers of the earth to worship and to appreciate the Antichrist and to respect him and to give him the honor that he deserves. Because why? Because he's been raised from the dead. He's proved that he's, an, he's, he's a superman. He's overcome death. And then he goes on in verse 13 and he says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down um, out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And so where did we read about fire coming down? The two witnesses, just a couple of chapters previous, the two witnesses. And so here is, it's a fake. Do you see he is emulating God's authority Uh, here on earth. And then it goes on in verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And so he is going to encourage worship of the beast and he is going in part to do that by encouraging the people of the earth and how this happens and what it looks like, I don't know, but to make some representation of the beast to which people will give their honor and express uh, their worship. Then in verse 15, we have another one of these poieos, if you will, and he says, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so not only does he give breath to, the be- to this image so it speaks, but that he causes those who don't listen to the image and bow before it to be killed. Same picture that we have in the book of Daniel and his friends being unwilling to bow down before the statue that is erected before them. And so we don't know what it means to give breath to the beast. We don't know if this is the point in history where machine learning will tip over into what will be claimed to be a sentient existence, and that this man will somehow have a hand in that. Have no idea. Have no idea. Perhaps genetic engineering is going to be at the basis of this. And that, you know, uh, that uh, transhumanism, <laughs> where a computer is gonna be mashed in with uh, biological entities. We don't know what it is, but what we know is that it is a sign, a symbol of the authority of the Antichrist, of the beast from the sea. And that when people don't bow down to it, they are killed. They are killed. 
And then he goes on and he says, verse 16, there's the next poieo. He says, and he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so there's a lot of speculation about this, uh, but he causes all of uh, the worshipers of the beast to receive a mark. The same way all of God's people are marked by the Holy Spirit, so too there's going to be a mark. Now, there's a lot of speculation about is this a banking system? Is this credit cards? Are, you know, we're all going to have our credit card number pasted on our forehead or on our hand. Well, it's clearly not. Why do we know it's not, that, it's not a banking system in that sense? So if you're worried about your credit card, you know, you're worried about doing online transactions, you should worry about your money getting stole, but you don't have to worry that it's the mark of the beast because every one of those transactions is based on each one of us having a unique number, a unique account number. Here, everybody has the same mark, the same number, and this is an identifier that this says possession. This says part of the club. And if you, don't, if you are not part of the club, you cannot travel, you cannot buy, you cannot sell. And, and one just imagines what's gonna happen when the vaccine becomes readily avail available and the anti-vaxxers say, I am not gonna take that vaccine because whatever reason they're gonna give. And then lo and behold, they're gonna get on a plane, try to get on a plane and somebody's gonna say, well, let me see the stamp on your license that demonstrates you've been vaccinated. Oh, sorry, you can't, can't do that. Or you wanna go into the store, I can't go into the store. You know, look, I mean, this is like I'm making it up, it's insane, but you can see how easily this can take place. And so this is a mark that everybody is gonna have. And I want you to stop and think about this. This is the ultimate cancel culture. This is the ultimate cancel culture. This is if you do not toe the line, if you do not repeat the words I give you to repeat, if you do not state the state's policies and uphold them as you are instructed to uphold them, you are canceled. And in the most literal way, because it will be death. It will mean death. And so what I want you to see basically though is through this is that there's a picture here of us of a complete the, this is the false prophet. That's what he's called in the text, later in the text. He's a false prophet. He's a false prophet of who? Of the beast from the sea who is himself the tool of Satan. And so we have an entire structure, religious structure built around this. And people's hearts respond to this. Why? Why is it pictured in a religious way like this? because we are religious people. We are religious beings. We were created for what? For worship, for worship. And Satan, the enemy of our souls and God's enemy will take that part of our essence and will twist it and use it for his selfish and destructive ends. And so we have to recognize that it is often through the clergy that our enemy is at work. And all we have to do is look at church history and we can see cult after cult after cult, uh, apostate denomination after apostate denomination who reject Jesus as the son of God, who add to the good news of Messiah by saying you must do this in addition to that. We see that over and over and over again. And then you expand that out into the world's religions. And you want to see one of the greatest demonic deceptions ever perpetrated on man. All you have to do is look at Islam. It is Islam. Now, I'm not attacking people who are Muslim. They are deceived, just like I was deceived before I came to Messiah Jesus. But the system that has deceived them has its roots in the dragon. And it is perpetrated, it will be taken advantage of by the political leader who is the beast from the sea, and it will be manifest by a man who is like a lamb 
who is gentle and leads people and God loves everybody and, and we just need to embrace everybody and love wins and we all make it in the end and all of these things. And these are the tools that Satan has at his disposal and that he is using in your day and my day and just reminds us of why we must be vigilant, why we must know our enemy and know that even though the state is God's intention for good in our lives, it is easily corrupted and used for ill. And we need to be careful. We need to be able to discern when the state is doing what God wants it to do and when it is calling us to do that which God prohibits. And we need to be aware that the religious people around us just because they were religious, just because they encourage worship, just because they encourage their version of what love looks like for other people, just because they claim unity. Look, if we could all just get together, if we could just all imagine there's no, right? You think about John Lennon's song, you know, straight out of the pit of hell. We just, we can't we just all get along? And this is, these are Satan's ploys, and we see in the end, in these last three and a half years of the tribulation period, these things brought into stark and clear relief for us in the person of the Antichrist and in the person of the false prophet. And we look at that and we say, oh, now I understand what I see in the world around me. Now I am better equipped to resist that pull, to be led astray. I'm not suggesting if you know Messiah Jesus and you start saying things that are wrong, you're no longer saved, but you are gonna be ineffective. You are not gonna be salt and light in a world that needs it so desperately. But this is the last thing that I wanna share, is that not only does the enemy uh, use political forces, and not only does he uh, wield this deceptive spiritual influence, our enemy is helpless against God, ultimately helpless against God. And it's interesting to me that both of these passages end in kind of parallel ways. Look with me, if you will, uh, back at verse eight of the chapter. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of, li of the life of the lamb who has been slain. So whose name has been written in the lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world? That is everybody who comes to faith in Messiah Jesus. Nobody comes to faith in Messiah Jesus who is not written in that book. And so there's this picture of God's sovereignty that is presented here in the midst of the darkness of the Antichrist and his political rule. And he goes on and he says in verse nine, if anyone has an ear to hear, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And these are words that are, are in, in every other place where this is stated, it is directed to the church. But again, it's interesting to note it doesn't say to those in the church, but it's just saying anyone who has ears to hear, and these are, I believe, directed to the believers who are alive during the time of the tribulation. He says, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Uh, here is the perseverance and faith of the saints. And so, again, I don't have time to, to unpack this, but I would encourage you to, to look up Isaiah chapter 33, verse 1, but read it in its context. Go back and start in chapter 32 of Isaiah and then read past verse 1 as well. Because what you have here is a prophecy of, I believe, that will ultimately be fulfilled by Messiah Jesus coming to rule and reign on the earth. And in the midst of this prophecy, at the beginning of chapter 33, he says to Israel, who is suffering under all kinds of unrighteous rulers of the pagan kings around them, he's saying, don't worry, because everybody who dishes it out is going to get it in the end. And that's it. He says, look, even though you are going to suffer, even though you are going to die, I want you to know, I want you to know that no one is going to go unjudged and that all of the evil and those who perpetrated it will be held to account. 
and we read about that later in the book when we see uh, we see the the uh, the beast from the sea, the antichrist, and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire, ultimately destroyed. And so, what God is saying to to the believers is, look. You can, be, you can have perseverance and faith. You can have stick to and you can be faithful in the midst of all of this, knowing that your vindication is sure. Your vindication is sure. Because isn't that what wears us down, what wears us out, that, that kind of tempts us to quit? It's like, what's the point? What's the point? I can't win. I can't win. I'm not going to win. My voice is not going to be heard. They're going to triumph. Evil is going to win. And the book here, John is reminding us, and he's saying, no, what goes around comes around. And this should be the basis for your perseverance and for your faithfulness as you encounter these things. And then at the end of the passage in verse 18, it says, here is wisdom. Let him who understands and under, has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man and his number is 666. It is not 666. It is 666, right? That's the number of the beast. And so basically what he's saying is is that based on the Hebrew alphabet and the Jewish technique of applying each letter of the alphabet or giving each letter of the alphabet a numeric value, you can determine the numeric value of people's names. So like Daniel, I think in Gematria is like 76 or something like that. But the problem is, is that we, we can't use that to figure it out. We don't know whose name that is because any number of people's names equals 666 today. But in that day, when the believers are going through what they are going through, they will be able to identify the beast. They will be able to be sure that the one they are refusing to worship is the one God wrote about through the Apostle John. And once again, God's providence and God's sovereignty becomes their comfort, their comfort. And isn't the same true for us today? That it is recognizing our call, that it is God's call on our lives. It is God's work in our lives. It is God's willingness and ability to open our eyes to understand the good news of Messiah that any of us come to faith and that it is he who holds us in his right hand and no one can separate us from the love of God, which is in Messiah Jesus. And so as we go through the things we're going through, we want to remember that Yes, Satan is at work in the political systems around us. Yes, Satan is at work in the religious systems around us. But God is sovereign, and we are secure in his hands. And we, by his grace, can continue to serve him in love by proclaiming Messiah's good news to a world that needs it so desperately. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this uh, amazing picture of the Antichrist and of his false prophet. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that uh, we face an enemy who is often a wolf in sheep's clothing. Lord, we cry out to you for the wisdom, the insight, that we would be students of your word, that we would know the truth so that when we hear lies, we can recognize them, and we will not respond to them. We will not be lured in. We will not lose our voice. We will not lose our ability to impact this dark world with the light of Messiah's good news. Lord, we thank you that you have warned us, that you've told us what our enemy looks like, that we might be forewarned and forearmed. Lord, I pray for those who have yet to come to know him, uh, know our Messiah, that they would recognize the deception under which they live, They would see the shallowness of the promises that are made and the claims that are made. And they would recognize that there is no hope in man, but that there is hope in the one true Lamb of God, your Son, and that through faith in him, they would be saved, Lord, and that they would know their names were written in the Lamb's book of life from all eternity. 
So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you that you were at work. Give us hope. Give us encouragement that we might serve you with a glad heart. In Yeshua's name, amen.